Good evening. I want to welcome everyone here tonight to our next installment of uh, the uh, Torah study for Bereans. Tonight we're going to be looking at uh, Joshua chapter 2. And uh, <clears throat> let's go ahead and begin with our with our blessing. Baruch atah Adonai Eloheinu melech haolam asher ki dishanu b'mitzvah tah v'tzivanu l'asok b'divrei Torah. Blessed are you, O Lord, our God, King of the universe, who sanctifies us in his commands and commands us to engross ourselves in words of Torah. All right, now, um, are there any questions or comments or anything from, uh, from anyone for last week's, uh, last week's um, uh, lesson? Anything about that? All right, so... Let's go ahead and, and here we've got our first couple of, uh, of slides that are, that are always going to be there just so that you know you can get a real thumbnail view of, of what, um, what we'll be studying. And, um, and here's our map showing the various uh, nations or tribes that uh, Israel was going to be coming up against in the land of, uh, of the land of Canaan. All right. Now, let's go ahead with the uh, first, first verse of chapter 2. Then Joshua, son of Nun, son of Nun, secretly sent out two spies from Shittim, saying, Go explore the land, especially Jericho. So they went, and they came to the house of a prostitute named, whose name was Rahab, and lodged there. All right, so... Tonight's class kind of just uh, jumps jumps right into more preparation for the uh, invasion of Canaan. Now this this uh, this slide here kind of shows the proximity of the the Isra Israelite camp to the Jordan River and to Jericho. Now it doesn't show Jericho on here, but it shows Gilgal, which is very close to Jericho, and uh, then the plains of Moab or uh, Abel Shatim. And this area here uh, where uh, the Israel was, that's, that's a pretty, pretty uh, large area. And it's uh, very, uh, even today, it's got a lot of agriculture there, a lot of uh, um, orchards and, and uh, different types of agriculture. And uh, so this, they were camped out along here, uh, you know, from almost from the Dead Sea uh, up uh, here to uh, Adam and, and to the, the river or the, yeah, the river Jabak. Jibak. And this, this whole area, because like I said, there's a couple of million folks there. And they were waiting to cross over into, into Canaan. And then here is um, um, Gilgal, uh, Jericho is right, right about there. And um, the distance from Jericho over here to the the um, Jordan River was about five miles. It wasn't very long at all. So um, the uh, if you look at um, let's see, I don't think I did. Yeah, here's a. Uh, I wanted to kind of show you a artist representation of what Jericho might have looked like. This is based on some of their um, their um, archaeology and and so forth. So you can see that um, they had two walls, and that uh, um, Rahab lived in one of these places where they had the 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 uh, house right on the wall, right next to the wall. One of those areas there. Um, or back over here. It doesn't really matter. I mean, we don't know exactly uh, what her what her house uh, was and where it was because um, by this time uh, they've lost the red uh, red cord that was hanging in her window. But uh, anyway, they uh, Jericho is well, very well defended. One of the oldest uh, cities in the in the world at that time, and they had <clears throat> down here a moat around it. And then they had about a 10 to 15 foot, um, I don't know what you call it, escarpment, but uh, a rock wall. And then above that, another 
uh, three meter wall that uh, that went right here. You can see that the reddish wall, and then they came inside, and then there was another wall there. So uh, the secondary wall was because the city had kept growing, and they added more more people outside. So um, anyway, uh, Joshua. Let's see. Let me let me show you. There's another couple of pictures. Okay, here are the ruins of ancient Jericho today. You can uh, see, and the, these these holes here. That's where archaeologists have come in and done uh, archaeological digs to try to decipher all of the different people that uh, that were uh, living. You know what was going on there in the um, uh, in in Jericho, but um, this is what kind of what it looks like today. It's uh, over on the West Bank, or what they call the West Bank, but it's uh, it's uh, actually Jewish Israeli territory, and uh, um, we won't get into all of that. So um, there are a lot of uh, you know there's there's agriculture all the way around it. You can see that. And so anyway, those are the pictures, and here is a picture. Now this is down at Beersheba that uh, just to kind of show, these are some of the walls that have been kind of sort of reconstructed a little bit. And this kind of, this shows uh, houses that were right up next to the, on the wall itself. Now this, this um, um, casement wall here had uh, a mud brick wall here, and then it was filled with earth. And then another mud brick wall over here, and there's maybe three to six feet of, of earth in between these two. So that was fairly common among the the cities of that day. Now, uh, going on, uh, Joshua, uh, he had learned a few lessons uh, about uh, the spying situation back in the day, because you remember when when 40 years earlier, when they sent out the spies, it was kind of a um very public thing and maybe there was some fanfare or, or anything but uh it was one of those deals where um the the spies went out they were they were very public because it names and actually in the bible it names who the spies were and who they represented and and so forth and so this time though joshua said man we're not going to do that again and so he sent out two spies secretly. And, you know, even to this day, we don't know who those spies were. Now, uh, Jewish Midrash says that it was uh, Caleb and the, the high priest Eliezer. Well, you know, that is strictly Midrash, and there is nothing in the Bible that would back that up. And so I, I suspect that it was probably more likely that it was a couple of younger men that were going to go out and, and uh, do the spying. So Joshua, um, he was, you know, I've read some of the, the commentaries about how um, Joshua, you know, he, he's sending out spies. Well, you know, he's, um, um, uh, He's being, he's, he's not, not being, um, I mean, he, he was not showing faith in God because he was sending out these spies, but you know, Joshua really didn't know what was, um, what was going on here. I mean, he, he didn't know how the Lord was going to, uh, conquer the land for them. And, and, uh, uh, so, um, anyway, they, um, Joshua was just doing what he thought he should as a, as a, you know, very cautious general, he's sending out spies and, you know, Moses had done the same thing 40 years before. And so, uh, I think the idea that, uh, some people try to denigrate Joshua for sending out these spies and saying that, oh, he wasn't trusting God. That's, uh, you know, they're. Always, uh, I think it's bunk. So anyway, um, the best way to gather intelligence, you know, you need intelligence before you go out and fight somebody. 
best way to do it, send out some spies. Because I can, I can bet you dollars to donuts that the Canaanites had sent out spies to uh, spy on uh, Israel because, uh, you know, they're, they're over there looking uh, through the reeds on the, on the bank of the Jordan and looking there and says, uh, there's two million invaders over there and uh, they're coming across. So uh, they were already <clears throat> spying on Israel too. All right. So it wasn't a long journey. I mean, they could, it was like five miles from crossing the river Jordan to Jericho. Now they, um, you know, I mean, on a good forced march, I mean, they could have made that five miles in, uh, in an hour, but say, you know, they were, they were spies. So maybe they were just wandering along looking like, okay, yeah, we're just, uh, we're just travelers. We're not spies. We're just trying to go along here and sightseeing and so forth. And, and uh, so it might've taken them a couple hours. It did not take long to get, a, to get from the Jordan river over to uh, Jericho. So what do they do? They go to Jericho and the first thing they do, they go to uh, 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 Rahab's motel sex, uh, six. And it was uh, a combination of uh, inn and brothel. And so, um, you know, there, there's some people that say, well, maybe, maybe she wasn't really a prostitute, but it, that's what it says. It wasn't even, even over in, in, uh, in, um, Hebrews, it says that she was a prostitute and she ran this in. And I think she was kind of an enterprising lady as we see later on. There's some other ideas that, uh, some things that she did, but, uh, um, not to, uh, to kind of uh, judge her because of her occupation, uh, I think is is a little bit tough. It's uh, you know we don't know what circumstances she was in, and um, uh, to be quite frank about it, I've been uh, all over the world and have seen situations where uh, ladies were kind of forced into that kind of an occupation because that's all there was, and it was either that or their family starved. And so it's, it's one of those kind of a deals where I, I really don't like to judge people on that, uh, on that basis. So, um, and I kind of have to agree with Michael there that he, he's reluctant to judge uh, Rahab. All right, so uh, the idea that they went into a Rahab's establishment there I think it's brilliant because that's where, when people would come in and visit, uh, the, the go to these various cities, that's the first thing that they did. They went to the local tavern, inn, brothel, uh, you know, internet cafe, whatever it was. I mean, it was that was the the happening place in the city, and so that's where they would go and hang out. And so uh, they could do that and not really arouse any suspicions because they could, uh, they could be, you know, posing as traveling merchants or, or whatever it was. So they went there and also uh, you're, I'm sure that there's probably alcohol there on the, on the premises. And so when, when there's that, then people to start drinking, they start talking. So the spies could gather a lot of information that way. So, um, anyway, going on to chapter two, uh, verses two and three. The king of Jericho was told some men from B'nai Israel have just come here tonight to spy out the land. So the king of Jericho sent word to Rahab saying, bring out the men who came to you who entered your house for they have come to spy out the land, all the land. Um, and so for all of their, all of their precautions, um, you know, it somehow came known to the king of Jericho that there were two Israeli spies in the city. Now, it's estimated that there were maybe 1,200 to 3,000 inhabitants in Jericho at the time. And so the presence, uh, I mean, that's, that's not a lot of people. Um, you know, I, uh, Alan and I graduated from a, uh, uh, the Coast Guard Academy. And, and you know, I, I think at that time, there was um, maybe at the highest, it would have been, a thousand people there, students there, and uh, pretty much, you know, we knew everybody or, or knew um, 
you know, maybe we didn't, we weren't really, really familiar with everybody, but you know, we kind of had a good idea who all of the guys were and, um, um, at least recognize them by face anyway. And so, uh, the idea that these people who lived there from birth and they're, you know, they grew up in it. So anywhere from 1200 to 3000 people, uh, they pretty much knew everybody that lived there. So the idea that a couple of strangers coming in here combined with, you know, what, 2 million invaders right uh, 10 miles away across the river, um, that would have, uh, you know, that would have put everybody on edge. And so the king would have been suspicious. And so, you know, it's kind of interesting that he knew exactly where to go looking for the spies. And uh, in fact, there was a, there's a law in the Code of Hammurabi, Rabbi Trail here, uh, there's a law in the Code of Amor Hammurabi that, uh, that stated that if any uh, woman who keeps a house of, uh, uh, you know, a bordello or, uh, you know, the red light house there, um, a brothel, if, if she housed anyone who was a uh, spy or was a um, dissident or somebody that was against the, the government, then uh, she was responsible and she could be held liable for, for them if she didn't turn them over to the authorities. So, I mean, it was a well-recognized uh, time, you know, for a re recognized thing at that time that, um, you know, these places of what we call ill repute today, um, that was where people went. And, and so that's where they also knew that bad guys went too. That's why the king sent his troops over there and told Rahab, okay, hand them over. And um, um, so, you know, that, that's uh, Rahab's bar and grill there was, the, was immediately suspect. Now, I don't know how many other places like that there were in, in Jericho, uh, but it's possible that there were others. And so if, it, if there were, then I'm sure the uh, proprietor of those establishments would have also received a visit from the king's men. So, anyway, um, <clears throat> any questions so far? Comments? Okay. Uh, going on, <clears throat> verse four through seven. But the woman took the two men and hid them, said, Yes, the men did come to me, but uh, I didn't know where they were from. So when it was time to shut the gate at dark, the men went out, and I don't know where they went. But uh, pursue them quickly, uh, for you may overtake them. But she had already taken them up to the roof and hid them in the st stalks of flax uh, that uh, she had spread out on the, on the roof. So the men pursued them on the road to the fords of the Jordan, um, and so as soon as the pursuers had gone out, uh, they shut the, they shut the gate there, uh, of, in, in Jericho. Now, perhaps, uh, you know, Rahab anticipated the King's questions and she'd already, already hidden the men away under the stacks of flax up on the, on the roof of her house. And that area was, you know, it could very well have been on top of the, the outer wall of the city. And, you know, most houses of that day had flat roofs that served as a, uh, you know, as a adjunct living area. You know, they could, they could uh, go up there and stretch out some, some cloth or uh, some other type of awning uh, on the roof. And that would keep the house below a little bit cooler and plus they could get up there in the evening breezes and the sun, uh, uh, you know, having shade uh, would give them uh, less of a, um, well, it would, it, would, it would make it cooler from the, the sun. Um, so, um, in, in fact, if you go to tropical areas of the world today, um, all over the world, if you're in, I mean, it doesn't matter whether it's South America or Africa or Asia, um, in the tropics, 
where they have the flat roofs, um, they will always have some kind of a shade area, shaded area up there, and people use those areas as a as a living, you know, a living area, a living room, as it were, because there could be some kind of a shade, uh, a breeze coming through, and then if you got the shade, uh, that was uh, that was even better. So you know, this is where um, you know, and also you could look out all over the roofs of people's houses in the tropics there. And, and that's also kind of sometimes where they would store store things. You know, they would put, uh, you know, they have living quarters, but it's also kind of a junk catcher too. So she had this, uh, these stacks of flax there. Well, what's, what's flax? Flax are the, are the materials that, uh, from which they made linen back in those days. They would take the flax and they would beat, beat them up and, uh, you know, put them in water and soak them in, and so forth and then the fibers of the flax would uh, they could take that and it would soften them up they could strip them out of the stalk and and uh, then they could weave it into cloth and of course uh, flax uh, linen was one of the major things that they had for uh, non-animal skin clothing or animal product clothing because they could either have skins or they could have wool or they could have linen. And you remember that uh, the Bible says that the priests were, were to wear linen undergarments uh, so that uh, when they were serving, they would not, uh, they wouldn't sweat like they would if they were wearing uh, uh, animal skins or wool. Okay, so, um, and then this flax up on the roof indicated this, this occurred somewhere around the April, March, uh, March, April time frame, because that's when flax was harvested in that, in that area. So, um, but at any rate, um, Rahab, you know, she had a good storyline already concocted and, um, you know, it had just enough of a ring of truth to it combined with her admission that yeah the men were indeed they had they'd called it her establishment uh, because you know if she had denied it they may have looked at her and said yeah what are you trying to to um, um, hide here but she readily admitted it and said yeah they were they were here but uh, I didn't know where they were from or anything and then they left right before dark uh, probably to try to get out the gate before the gate was closed. So if you hurry, you might catch them heading back over there to the Israeli camp. And so her pursuers then took off after them and they headed back over to uh, the Jordan River. And so uh, going on in uh, verse eight says, now before they lay down, she came up to them on the roof and said, okay, uh, I know that Adonai has given you the land dread of you has fallen on us and all the inhabitants of the land and, uh, are melting in fear before you uh, for we have heard how Adonai dried up the water of the red, uh, sea of reeds before you uh, when you came out of Egypt and what uh, you did to the two kings of the Amorites that were beyond the Jordan to uh, Sihon and Og uh, whom you utterly destroyed all right so um Rahab's uh, reference here to the fear of the Israelites that God had put uh, into the Canaanites' heart. This, this, uh, she said, the terror of you has fallen upon us. Um, it shows that the Lord actually had fulfilled His promise that He uh, that He gave to the Israelites in Exodus twenty three, and also in Deuteronomy two twenty five and eleven twenty five, where He said that, okay, I'm going to make these people afraid of you. And uh, so th then this little stint that she's talking here is uh, one of the longest uninterrupted statements by a woman in the, in the Bible. So uh, that little, uh, if you ever get uh, in, a, in one of those uh, trivial pursuits or jeopardy, that's a good one to say, you know. Uh, what was the longest speech from, uh, from a woman? Well, it was Rahab. All right. Um, then, then she also says that uh, Sihon and Og, whom you utterly destroyed. Now, the word there that she's used is a Hebrew word, harem. It's a technical term that um, it's used, uh, and I forgot to turn my slide here. 
it's a technical term that uh, it's used to uh, mean where uh, one group of people totally just annihilates and totally destroys something uh, because what that is, that makes it an, a sacrifice to their gods. They don't keep anything for themselves. They just totally destroy it like a burnt offering. And that's the, the actual word there is harem. And that's what uh, she was saying that they were, they were doing. So, and um, you know, the, the idea that, um, uh, and I mentioned later on, the merchants and traders, they stayed there at her inn because that's where people stayed. And, um, you know, that's, that was the, the place where you're going to have all sorts of, uh, of uh, information flowing uh, is in those, in the inns and the taverns and so forth. So, in fact, she had, uh, uh, she had heard about the Red Sea crossing. I mean, that was, that was fact. It wasn't uh, something that, that uh, was just speculation. It was fact to her that uh, God had dried up the seabed. They went across, the Israelites went across, and then he rolled the waters back over the Egyptians and, and just destroyed them. So she had heard all these stories already. So um, said when, when we heard about it, our hearts melted and no spirit remained anymore in anyone because of you. For Adonai, your God, he is God in heaven above and on earth beneath. So now, please swear to me by Adonai, since I have dealt kindly with you, that you will also deal kindly with my father's house. Give me a true sign that you will spare the lives of my father, my mother, my brothers, my sister, and all who belong to them, and save our lives from death. All right. Um, now, the... the I'd already mentioned that the people of, of Rahab's time there, they would, uh, they would stay in those kind of places because that's all there was, you know, that's all there was. And, and it was a good place for, that's why the spies went there because that's, that's where people talk. So verse 11 is, uh, you, we could call that Rahab's confession of faith. Now, she certainly looked around at the circumstances and saw that the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob was certainly stronger than the wood and stone idols that she worshiped. And they could look across over there the, at the, uh, across the Jordan. And there's, uh, um, yeah, there's just a gazillion of the Israelites over there waiting to come across the border and, uh, conquer the land. So, uh, I think it's the, the imagery that she says, you know, that we just, we just melted away kind of like the wicked witch of the West. When you pour water on her, they just, they just melted. They had no more strength at all. So, um, that's, that's kind of her, her confession of faith. And, re and remember that people back in those days, the pagans, they worshiped nature. They were a polytheistic, uh, religion they had a polytheistic religion and they worshiped the various aspect of nature as the as the deity so that uh when uh you know like for instance you know you got in egypt they had the sun god then they had the moon god and then they had the river god and they had whatever you know the different different uh natural aspects that they would assign a deity to that. So when she says, when uh, when Rahab uh, gets up there and says, uh, for your God, Adonai, your God, he is God in heaven above and on earth beneath. So basically what she's saying that everything in between, everything is, is uh, encompassed in uh, in God, the uh, your, your God, uh, uh, the God of these spies, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And so basically that's what she's saying that uh, everything that we got over here, that's nothing compared to uh, your God. So, uh, so she, here she is, she's going to then try to strike a deal with, uh, with the spies and said, okay, now look, I've been got, I've been good to you guys. So, you know, I'm hoping that you're going to be good to me 
and uh, she figured that uh, you, you know, they were going to come in, the Israelites were going to come in and destroy the city, kill everybody, and so she wanted to strike a deal. And uh, so a lot of people said, oh, yeah, because she can't, became a believer. And I said, well, maybe so. But at the same time, she's also looking at the circumstances and saw that uh, that you know, definitely, definitely uh, her false deities or her you know little gods, little G gods, couldn't hold a candle to the one true God. Now, Hebrews 11 talks about her and says that, um, um, that she was saved by her faith in Israel's God and not by what she did for the spies. That's not what it, what it did. In fact, uh, Hebrews 11.31 uh, says, by faith, and by faith, Rahab the prostitute did not perish with those who were disobedient because she welcomed the spies with shalom. All right, so everybody knew that what all had happened with Israel, they, they all knew the, you know, the story that Rahab came up with. Everybody knew it. And so she's the only one that said, you know what? I want to go make peace with these guys because their God is bigger. I want, I want some of that. And so verse 12, then she enters into an oath with the spies so that she could be saved. Now her intent is also to save her family, all, uh, you know, and, and her father's house, she said. So um, even though many will look kind of down on her because of her occupation, she still loved her family enough to basically commit treason to protect them. So, all right, before we go on, any, uh, any other comments or questions before we go to verse 14? Well, uh, yeah, Cynthia had said that uh, you, you can't hear her, but uh, said that uh, the idea of prostitution may not have had the stigma back in those days that it did, that it does. Uh, because also, remember, they had, uh, they had temple prostitution. That was part of their, uh, their worship um, universe there that uh, there there were temple prostitutes so we uh we don't really know uh, what uh, what flavor of prostitute she was uh but since it didn't say anything about her religious aspects uh we can possibly assume that she was just the mark one mod zero type uh prostitute uh you know the lady on the street so uh, and, and she could, yeah, she could have been, you know, um, she could have been the madam or, or whatever. I, I don't know. That's just that, uh, she, that's, that was her occupation when, uh, when the spies found her. So, uh, she, well, if you won, take, huh? well, if you take in consideration, I think it was, uh, I think it was Isaac who had, his son was betrothed to, um, uh, forgot her name. And then later on, he uh, he sleeps with her uh, as prostitution. He gives her uh, something for favor for a favor. And then later on, he finds out that his daughter-in-law supposed to be was pregnant with a child. He wants to burn her. And yeah, then he finds out that she's a prostitute that he made a deal with. He's like, oh, she's more righteous than I am. Yeah, that was so, Judah. Okay. Anyway. Yeah, that, that was, was Judah. Okay, that was Judah that did that. And. Uh, um, he was a son of a son of Jacob. And so, uh, right. yeah, that's, that's it. That uh, he was supposed to, uh, uh, he did not follow the, uh, Leverite, uh, Leverite laws when his first two sons died. And, uh, then the, then, uh, Tamar, the, the, the wife, the woman, he wanted to, uh, you know, he was going to have her marry then the youngest son, which would have been a, a long time away but anyway he said no nope, those right. other two died and uh so i'm not going to do that to my youngest son so anyway yeah that was uh that's a, a long a long story but uh right. the, the idea was that, but, he said that yeah, yes she was more righteous more righteous than he was so that is right. fact all right so uh let's see going on with uh 
with these guys. They, they entered into a, a verbal agreement and, uh, but it was, it was one of these kind of agreements that everybody, uh, that both sides very, you know, they recognized very well that, okay, this was a good agreement and uh, kind of like the old handshake of old, you know, okay, let's shake on it. And then, um, and so what, what did they say? Our lives for yours. Uh, that means that if we don't follow this out, uh, uh, then may, may we uh, die along with you. Um, so uh, they had three conditions that the spies, number one, he says, okay, now we got to survive this thing because uh, we can't guarantee your, your, your uh, safety if we don't make it. And then uh, Rahab was not to uh, report them. She was not to betray them in any, in any way. And, uh, um, so then the, the other one is that when Israel took the land, it, it would have to depend on when Israel took the land, then she would be saved. So, uh, there, there were agreements there and, uh, going on to 15 and 16. Uh, so she lowered them down on a rope through the window for her house was in the wall. She was living in the wall and, um, um, then she said to them, go to the hill country, lest the pursuers meet you and hide yourselves there for three days until the pursuers return. Afterwards, you may go your way. So, uh, you know, Rahab, uh, you know, she lived on the outer wall and said, and, and so she had access to lower the spies down to the earth outside the city gates. So she was in that outer, that outer wall of uh, Jericho. And so she let them out through a window or somehow and, and they escaped. And she told them, I said, look, don't go toward, go, don't go head, heading back over to uh, uh, the Jordan because they'll surely find you over there. Lots of guys and there's only two of you. They're going to be scouring that whole area. They'll catch you. Head back up the opposite direction. And uh, they wouldn't even think about that, that you would be running away from the Israelites. And so, you know, there are a lot of, caves and hidey holes where the the spies could avoid detection and you can see um in fact i just happen to have a picture of the area just west of jericho that's what it looks like even today and you'll look and there's little little caves there and this is just one little area of it and um uh, somebody's built them a nice condo there on the wall, but, um, you know, there's, there's all sorts of little limestone caves and so forth. Uh, if you, uh, look, I, I just took a picture of the, the, um, you know, this area here, uh, that was just west of Jericho, but that whole, the whole expanse of, uh, territory there was, was just like this. It just, rocks, sandstone, uh, caves, and all sorts of hiding places. So um, it was definitely, even today, it's a, it's a hide-and-seek uh, paradise. Okay, um, going on to 17. Then the men said to her, we will be released from this oath that you have made us swear unless when we come to this land, you tie this line of scarlet thread in the window through which you lowered us down and gather to yourselves, to yourself in the house, your father, your mother, your brothers, and all your father's household. Whoever goes out of the doors of your house into the street, his blood will be on his head and we will be innocent. But whoever is with you in the house, his blood will be on our head if any hand is laid on him. But if you divulge this business of ours, then we will be released from your oath that you have made us swear. All right, so uh, there's more conditions here. Rahab was supposed to tie this red cord uh, in her window, and uh, then all of her family would have to stay in the house, and then they could not divulge anything about the spies. What, what's, uh, um, what's interesting to me is that um, these spies 
they're making these conditions with with um, Rahab, and it almost assumes that I mean it's it's like they know how could they make these kind of predictions or these kind of conditions and say that yes she will be saved when they don't even know how God is going to hand Jericho over to them. Now they were probably thinking, okay, yeah, we're going to storm through a gate and then just the, the standard old um, warfare, you know, just head to head combat. Uh, and so, yeah, <clears throat> hold, uh, hang this in the door, in the, in the window, and we'll know from that, that you're the one that helped us. So, you know, had they known that, okay, okay yeah, God was going to send an earthquake and all of the, all of the walls of Jericho were just going to collapse outward. Um, maybe they would not have been so confident in uh, making this this uh, uh, contract with uh, with Rahab. But um, I just I just thought that was that was kind of interesting that they could make those kind of of uh, contracts or treaties or agreements covenant with uh, with Rahab and and promise it you know and maybe maybe it was that they would says okay yeah we'll make a we'll make a promise to this gal because she's kind of protecting us and we need three days of of uh um uh, uh, you know a head start so that we can get away from our pursuers and so we just you know we'll yeah whatever it is she wants yeah we'll tell her that and um you know perhaps the 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 skeptic and the critic in me says that, yeah, they'll tell her whatever she wanted to hear just so that she protected them and, and uh, they could get away. Maybe, uh, maybe again, that's, uh, that's me being the old uh, um, curmudgeon, but um, it was just interesting that they could, they would in their, in their heart, if they were actually true that, uh, that they made these, these agreements and expected it to uh, come to pass. So, um, going on to twenty one twenty two. So she said, according to your words, so be it. And she sent them away. After they had gone, she tied the yellow cord to the window. When they departed and came into the hill country, they stayed there for three days until the pursuers returned. Now the pursuers had looked for them all along the road, but had not found them. So, um, we don't know if these two spies had hung out up in a cave to where they could look and see the uh, the troops that had been out looking for them came home or whatever. But uh, we, you know, we do know that they stayed up there in the in the hills for three days, watching and um, trying to uh, avoid the their pursuers. Um, and um, the the scarlet cord, you know, a lot of people make try to make a big deal out of the scarlet cord that uh, you know the red color is certainly reminiscent of blood. Uh, hanging the cord in the window maybe is, is sort of similar to to the blood on the doorpost in Egypt. And uh, <clears throat> then another another explanation was that. Uh, even back then, the red was a uh, it was an advertisement for prostitution services. It was a the red light district, as it were. So it could possibly have been that. We really don't know what the significance of what the red is, but it makes good sermon fodder when you want to uh, uh, talk about the scarlet cord and the and the. Um, the blood of the savior and all that kind of stuff. And that, you know, that's okay, but, uh, it really doesn't, uh, the, the connection there to me is a little tenuous. So the, uh, the spies, they laid low for three days in the Hills and then, then they escaped. They made their escape and they went back to, uh, to, uh, Joshua. So they said, then, uh, -huh. Yeah. Yeah, it could have been uh, Cynthia saying that uh, 
that they is that you know the the cord and but it was a it was a cord it was a rope that they that they actually uh she let them down off the wall with um and so uh, they said that it could have very well have been that she was a maker of of uh, linen or or flax products linen products and that she already had something there that was red and it was visible and so it was just whatever was hand and they're you know they're talking and says yeah well here look you take this rope over here you throw it out the way you know hang it out the window so we'll know to uh, protect your family and so uh that's kind of what they were probably thinking about when they breached the walls they could look out there and they could see that rope and they'd know that that uh they were supposed to save um rahab and her family so uh, when the when the two men returned, uh, came down from the hill country, crossed over, and came to Joshua, son of Nun, uh, they reported to him all that had befallen them. Surely Adonai has given all of the land into our hands, they said to Joshua. Indeed, all of the inhabitants of the land have melted in fear before us. So how different is this report uh, here, 40 years later than the report that came from the 10 spies when they they uh, entered the land and they said, oh, we look like grasshoppers in their eyes and we look like grasshoppers in our own eyes, you know, and, and so they they didn't have the faith. But these two spies, they got out there and first of all, it was different. They reported right directly to Joshua, whereas the, the spies before they had an opportunity. They came in and they reported to all of the, you know, they they had already stirred the people up against Moses uh, before they ever even checked in with Moses. So um, these uh, these spies went right directly to Joshua as they should have and told him everything that happened to them. But they were encouraged. They, you know, their their idea was that. God has given this land to us because everybody in the city is just shaking in their boots. And uh, um, so, um, it, uh, just like I said, I like the imagery. It says that melted in fear. And so something that, uh, you know, when it's at the right temperature could be strong, but uh, you get it hot enough and you get enough heat against it then it just melts and it's not any good for its intended purpose in that form. So anyway, uh, and that's kind of where our story uh, ends tonight. Now next week, instead of just two spies crossing uh, the river, we're just going to see if we can get our, uh, our uh, heroes across the river and what all of that, uh, what all that's going to mean. So, are there any comments or questions regarding uh, the Joshua and the and the second book, the second uh, chapter of Joshua? No comments. Okay. Well, M M Michael, uh, what? <laughs> Michael. Michael McGuckin, okay. I'm disappointed in you, Michael. You only got two uh, things that you sent out to me today, uh, if you're still online. Uh, you could be like me last night, I was in a class and just as they were starting to have something really good on archeology, span my, uh, uh, my computer, my internet just conked out. And so I'm, I missed the whole thing on archeology span over in Israel, so. Uh, anyway, if if there's no, are there any other comments, questions, or anything like that? So my wife says that I need to count down, so that everybody knows that okay, we're just fixing to end the the, the lesson. So I'm counting down. Any comments? Five, four, three, two, one. Okay, Shavua Tov, everyone.